inside I was lost But now I'm found I'm a child of Israel I heard the sound Please give me the strength to stand today Show me the way to Zion. Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm back again for another Bible study. This time in the book of Daniel. That famous book that the Most High told Daniel to close up until the time of the end. But now the Most High is opening up this book so that all can see its secrets. We will be studying Daniel chapter 9, verses 24, which is the 70-week prophecy, the one that the whole world has wrong. Now, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes in order to give some background on Daniel the prophet, but I'm sure most of you know exactly who Daniel was. But just to give background. When Daniel was a young boy, he was among the many Israelites taken captive from Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon around 604 BC. God had warned the children of Israel and Judah at that time to stop sinning or this was going to happen. Uh, Prophet Jeremiah was the one who was delivering the message. And just as he predicted, it happened. You can find it in Jeremiah chapter 25. Daniel and his people had been in captivity for nearly 70 years when Daniel started seeking more revelation on Jeremiah's prophet, prophecy. While Daniel was in Babylon, he was well, well respected and served in prominent position in the governments of several Babylonian and Medo-Persian Medo rulers, including Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. Daniel knew from reading the prophecy of Jeremiah that the 70 years should almost be up. So it was in the first year of the reign of Darius that Daniel really started to seek the Lord on the issue concerning Jeremiah's prophecy. Daniel had a series of five major dreams and visions during his lifetime in Babylon. One, he had the Nebuchadnezzar dream of the four kingdoms with the statue. Everyone knows about that one. You can find that in chapter 2. Uh, number 2, he had uh, visions of the beast from the sea. That's in chapter 7. He had a vision of the ram and the goat in chapter 8. He had a vision of the 70 weeks which is in chapter 9, and that's the one that we're going to be studying today. And 5, he had a vision of kings of the north and south, which can be found in chapters 10 and 12. But as I said, this focus will, this study will focus on Daniel's fourth vision, which is listed in chapter 9. So now let's get started and see why everyone has the interpretation of this vision wrong. Okay, let's read Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, because we want to determine why the whole world has this prophecy wrong. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The whole world has Daniel 70 week prophecy wrong. Why is that so? Well, I can tell you. It's because this prophecy is specific to a special group of people and a special place. The people, Daniel's people, 
which are the blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the place, the place is the holy city, Jerusalem. The place where Christ was crucified. Now, if you don't have these two items correct, if you don't have the right people, if you don't have the right place, there's no way you can get the prophecy correct. And because the whole world has been deceived into believing the lie which Satan has put forth, they cannot recognize who the true people of God are. Nor do they know where the true holy city of Jerusalem is. Because of this, they will never understand when, where, and how the Daniel 70-week prophecy is being fulfilled. Even worse than that, this deception could cause people to lose their lives and lose their salvation. All of your leaders, teachers, pastors are deceived. They are blindly following the Antichrist and his attempt to establish the vision as God warned us in Daniel eleven fourteen. But the faithful, all-knowing, most high God has foretold that this would happen and he has warned us. He told us it's going to fail. So we'll go back and read Daniel 11, chapter, excuse me, Daniel chapter 11, verse 14. So in order to know how this vision will play out, you must know who the true players are. You must know what the true holy city is, and you must know who are the true people, who are the true Israelites Daniel was talking about. I mean, the uh, Most High was talking about in the, in the prophecy. These are the two things that you must watch. You must watch the true Israelites and you must watch the true Jerusalem site. Now I know I said some pretty powerful things in the previous slide. So I guess maybe I should kind of put some limits on what I'm going to talk about. Well in this video I'm not going to explain all the counting details on Daniel's 70 week vision. Because there are many websites and YouTube videos out there that do an excellent job on explaining the details of the 70 weeks, whether it's a week of weeks, a week of years, or whatever. What, whether it happened, wh whatever happened after the 69th week, 67th week, um, what happened in the middle of the week, all those kinds of details I'm not going to address in here. But I do want you to keep in mind when the Bible talks about a week you can have several different types of weeks. You can have the regular seven day week. You can have a week of weeks, which is 49 days, which seven times seven is 49. You can have what is called a week of years. And sometimes it's referred to as a sabbatical. Or you could have a week of sabbaticals which is referred to as a jubilee. So again, I'm not going to kind of get into those details, but I do want to say that when Daniel was given the 70-week prophecy, by looking at how things fell in place, we knew that uh, the prophecy was talking about a week of years. And so uh, Messiah came at the end of 69 weeks. So that was a week of years or 490 years. But I do want you to keep in mind that there were six things or six events that had to happen before this vision could be closed or sealed 
or basically saying that it had been fulfilled. So when Christ came as Messiah the Prince, after after the 69th week, that was not the period. Now one of the things that has to happen is the most holy has to be anointed. That has not happened. When Christ came as Messiah the Prince, he was not the most holy that was anointed. That is going to happen when Christ comes back the second time and he sits in his temple, his Ezekiel temple. And you can go into, go into Ezekiel chapter 41 verse 4 and you, you'll see it talks about the most holy. So all that being said, my focus in this video is to alert people to where this prophecy is being misapplied and misunderstood. So all what I'm saying is all the counting, I'm not going to get into those kinds of details because basically if you had the right people right, those details would be correct. Though those details are correct. So my focus is going to point out where the prophecy is being misapplied. Okay, let's revisit Daniel 9.24 again. And look at the six things that must happen before this prophecy can be completely fulfilled. It said, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And these are the things that must happen to the people and the city one, finish the transgression, that means finish sinning, to make an end to sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, five, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and six, to anoint the most holy. These are the things that must happen before the prophecy of vision can be sealed up or be totally fulfilled. This vision takes us all the way to the second coming of Christ, at which time he will sit in Ezekiel's temple and the most holy place will be anointed just as the prophecy Required. I know we're just repeating that. So, in this situation, well, where did the application of the prophecy go wrong? Go wrong. In other words, how are people misusing this prophecy? Well, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not senile. He's not blind, nor is he hard of hearing, like our father Jacob was. You remember the story. The imposters or Esau cannot go into the land, meaning the land of Israel, and take on the identity of Jacob, deceive the whole world into thinking that they are the true children of Israel and get away with it. In other words, there's a group of imposters in the land right now. These imposters will be destroyed. The Most High has already called this deception from the beginning. And it is listed in Revelation 3.9 and 2.9, in Lamentations 4.22, and in the chapter in Obadiah. Just to be clear on what this deception is. There is a real Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Mount of Olives, and there is a counterfeit Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, Mount Zion. There is a genuine or a real 
tribe of Judah with the other 11 tribes and there is a counterfeit tribe of Judah. These are imposters. These are Jews pretending to be the children of Jacob. These are the Israelis that are in the land now and the Bible refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. And this is listed again in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. This may seem harsh, but it is the truth and the Most High is revealing this right now. And it's very, very critical and very important that people understand this. Now I'm going to give you information to show you how to Jerusalem came about. In the Bible, there are two Jerusalems mentioned. There were two locations called Jerusalem. One was inhabited by the Amorites. You can find it in Joshua 10, 6. The other was inhabited by the Jebusites. And that's in Joshua 15, 63 and Judges 1, 21. One was located in the mountains. That's in Joshua 10, 6. The other one was surrounded by mountains. You can find that in Psalms 125, verse 2, and Nehemiah 8, 15. One, the children of Israel conquered when they entered the land of Israel. And that's in Judges 1, 8. One is in Mount Ephraim. You can find that in Genesis 33, 18, Genesis 14, 18, Joshua 18, 1, and Judges 4, 5. I encourage you to look these references up, even though we will look at a couple of them in detail. The other is just north of Ramon, which is in the southern part of Judea, of Judah. And it's near the inheritance of Simon, Simeon. You can find that in Joshua 19.78 and Zechariah 14.10, Joshua 15.21-32. 20, now before, there's a part two to, to all of this documentation on to Jerusalem but before we move on to part two of the to Jerusalem slide we're going to take a look a good look at some references that clearly point this out to you clearly points out the fact that there are two Jerusalems and so we'll do that next Okay, the map that you're looking at here is a map of the progress or the movement of the Israelites as they moved into Canaan and started to conquer it. And we're going to look at um, Joshua chapter 10 and uh, look at a story that very, very specifically shows that there were two Jerusalems. Now, I'm sure you all remember the story of the Gibeonites. After the Israelites had defeated the cities at Jericho and Ai, many of the nearby Canaanites united to form a large army to fight the Israelites. You can find that in Joshua chapter 9. But the Gibeonites decided to take a different approach. They went to Joshua and pretended to be a people from far away that was newly entering into the land. And they pointed to their donkeys loaded with worn out sacks and molded breads and old cracked wineskins as proof. They had put on worn and patched sandals and wore old clothes and the bread and their food supply was dry and molded in order to, in order to trick the Israelites into befriending them. 
they asked Joshua to make a treaty with them for protection, and he did. Even though Joshua found out later that they were lying, he was bound by his promise. You can find this story and also in Joshua 9. So let's read uh, Joshua 10, verse 3, 3 through 5. These verses clearly confirm that there, were, there was a Jerusalem of the Amorite, and Joshua defeated that Jerusalem. King David is one who took or defeated the Jerusalem of the Jebusite. And he did not do that until some 300 years after Joshua had conquered Jerusalem of the Amorites. So let's read Joshua 10.3. Wherefore Adonazak, king of Jerusalem, sent Haram, king of Hebron, and unto Param, king of Jasmuth, and unto Japia, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may smite Gideon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So we see these five kings are all Amorite kings, and they are asking Band together so they can beat up on the Gibeonites because the Gibeonites have the ones who've already made a treaty with the Israelites. So therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, which is Amorite Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jebus, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered themselves together and went up and they and all their hosts and encamped before Gimeon to make war against it. So I basically wanted to point that particular scripture out because it's very, very clear that we're talking about two different Jerusalems. Now the next map that I presented is just to show you that these two Jew Jerusalems are some 70 miles apart. One is in the north of Israel, and the other is in the south of Israel. And now we'll go back and complete part two of our slide on Jerusalem. Remember, we took a little bit of a, a detour to kind of show you some detailed scripture on that. So now we're back on our two Jerusalem slide. Remember I told you there was a part two to the documentation on the fact that there uh, are two, two Jerusalems. So uh, in addition to what we've gone over already, one of the Jerusalem was a Jebusite fortress that King David captured. And it's the place where he set up his tabernacle to place the Ark of the Covenant which was re within the fortress or the citadel. One of the Jerusalem was the place where the house of Yahweh was. The place of the city of David which was fortified by Sol Solomon and other kings of Judah. You can see 2 Samuel 5, 9, Second Chronicles 8, 11, 1 Kings 9, 1 Kings 11, 27, Second Chronicles. Um, there are just many, many verses. Now this place was not where Solomon's temple was built because that was built on Mount Moriah. And you can find documentation on that in Second Chronicles 3, 1. This Jerusalem is the only place that has been found and proven to be a house of Yahweh in Israel. None of this ever has happened with the Jerusalem of the Amorite, which is in the north. Even though you never hear it published, it's been hidden. 
So in essence, we're talking about two different cities called Jerusalem. There's a Jerusalem of the Amorites, which is in North Israel. And there's a Jerusalem of the Jebusite, which is the Jerusalem of the South, the Jerusalem that King David had, the Jerusalem where Christ died. These two Jerusalems, or two cities, are about 70 miles apart. I think we've covered most of this, but it's just amazing the amount of information on this, yet it's been totally hidden and kept from the people. So again, that's information on the two Jerusalems. Now that we've had a chance to study these two Jerusalem, I have a question for you, and it's in three parts. Part one. Which do you think is the true Jerusalem where Christ was crucified? A reference would be 11, Revelation 11.8. 11, Which do you think Christ is going to return to when his feet split Mount Olive and he comes back the second time as in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4 which do you think Christ meant when he promised deliverance to those in Jerusalem and in Mount Zion you can find that in Joel chapter 3 32 Obadiah 1 17 and the consolation question is, where do you want to be when Christ returns? When he comes in power and glory. Think about those questions because it's amazing in my understanding that so many people have no idea that that place that they're calling Jerusalem is nothing but a movie set, a basically a movie set. People are being deceived. This has been known about for years, and the public does not know. What about the many Christians who are flocking there? The many people who are flocking there, thinking that this is the true Jerusalem. It's just amazing. Now your head may be spinning in unbelief. And you may be asking yourself, how could this have happened? Well, I'll tell you. The Bible teaches us that the serpent, the devil, Satan, would deceive the whole world. That's in Revelation 12, 9. With his lies and his tricks and his, and his deception. It said that he would deceive the whole world and this is just a part of his de deceptions he has now tricked basically the whole world into thinking that that Jerusalem is the place where Christ lived and died well well basically where he was he was crucified it is not it is not and it is known about it they know about it so how did this happen? Well, let me give you some facts. In 135 AD, the Roman ruler Hadrian changed the name of Jerusalem of the Jebusite to Aelia Capitona. 
and Hadrian orchestrated a plan to keep the real Hebrews, Israelites, and the converted uh, Jewish people from knowing where the real Jew Jerusalem was. So Hadrian ran the Jews out of the city in 132 AD and then he changed the name. So the Hebrews were forced to reside in Galilee from 124 to 325 AD and they lost track of where the true Jerusalem was. So after about three, about 200 years in 326 AD, Constantine began to set his operation up in the Amorite Jerusalem and started the Roman Christian Church or Roman Christianity. And he gave the city the old name of the Amorite Jerusalem. Now these are facts. Check them out for yourself. It's very serious. So Amorite Jerusalem was actually, the name was given, was redone by the Roman. The Roman Catholics did this. I feel the 